Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today for um, panel eight, the penultimate panel of our Electoral Integrity Project workshop this week. Um, and the panel today is on electoral systems and their reform. And we have uh, four um, presenters, four, four papers today and, and a fantastic discussant who will be sharing the information or sharing their, their thoughts on these papers. Okay. So let's get started then. Um, I know that uh, Ian Repocos Batista is here with his uh, with his co-authors. Um, so you can start off with the presentation on changing rules to always win the game, changes in presidential term limits, rules, and electoral integrity. Fantastic. All right, you can take it away, Ian. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Holly. Thank you uh, so much for the organizers of this event. I'm going to share my screen right now. If you could just you're, you're seeing it. Uh, perfect. Uh, let me put it on full screen mode just to oops, uh, full screen mode. All right. Uh, so uh, good morning, everybody here from Brazil. I'm Mia Rebosas Batista, a PhD student at the Federal University of Pernambuco. And this paper is co-authored with Marcel Morris from Emory University and David Carroll from the Cairo Center. Uh, this paper is a product of our time, me and Marcella as graduate assistant at the Carter Center under the supervision of David. Uh, and we are interested here in uh, some empirical relationships between uh, presidential term limits, evasion, and electoral integrity. Uh, so first of all, uh, what we mean by presidential term limit evasion or manipulation or abolishment is whenever a leader gets into power, he or she already have uh, estimated amount of time limited, uh, probably if there is a term limit in place, they already have a total amount of time that he can serve, be it uh, one term or two terms if re-election is, uh, one re-election is allowed. And what we mean by evasion of mani or manipulation of term limits is when this leader attempts to change this term limits rule to prolong himself or herself in power. Uh, what we have here in this uh, first slide is three characters that represent uh, leaders that attempted and were successful uh, in evading term limits. Uh, we have here Rafael Correa from Ecuador, Hugo Chavez from Venezuela, and Evo Morales from Bolivia, some recent examples of leaders that managed to do so, managed to prolong their, their time in office by changing term limits role. And with these three examples, we have actually a plethora of strategies and maneuvers to do so. So, for example, the three of them resetted the clock after they rewritten the Constitution. Uh, so they had, uh, uh, at first, they have a total amount of time that they can serve, uh, but then they changed the, the Constitution and they say, well, now my time is go back to zero again, and we have to count the total amount of time again. But that, but that was not the only thing they did. Uh, also, Rafael Correa, for example, he managed through the legisl uh, legislative approval uh, to rewrite this presidential term limits rule to prolong himself in power. Hugo Chavez did so through a popular referendum in 2009, and Evo Morales did so uh, through a Supreme Court ruling to allow him to run for a fourth term in 2019. So we have here different strategies to prolong themselves in power. Uh, there's actually a long lived debate in political science if re election is democratic or not. Uh, some would say that uh, if re election is not allowed, you're actually taking one people out of, out of the population that can actually run for office, the president again, uh, while also say that uh, indefinite re election is, a, is actually bad for democracy uh, as it increases uh, incumbent advantage. Uh, through access to public goods, public resources, uh, and, and also, and, and so anyway, so the election can be a bad thing or a good thing, independently on the debate of the literature. Uh, but what we have in very recent years, and what moves us through this research agenda, is some uh, statements from quasi-judicial international bodies like the Council of Europe Venice Commission 2018, they were asked uh, by the Organization of American States if there is a, such a thing as a human right to re-election. A similar question was posed uh, by the Republic of Colombia to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in 2021. Uh, and both 
these bodies, these quasi interna quasi judicial international bodies, stated that there is no such a thing as a specific and distinct human right to re-election. Uh, so this is actually uh, 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 this is actually uh, uh, news for this debate uh, on the literature, and they are actually stating that. Uh, unlimited re-election and changing the rules to maintain and prolong them, themselves in power is actually uh, bad news for democracy. Uh, and when we went to the literature to see what the literature has uh, found as evidence uh, on this phenomenon, we actually found some interesting stuff. For example, uh, the leaders that try to do so, they, actually, they usually have a military background, specifically in the case of African countries. Uh, these leaders almost always face weaker legislative opposition. Uh, these phenomena mostly occur in context of low or in decline electoral competition. Uh, uh, some of these leaders actually are very popular and very autonomous from their own parties, this is specifically for the case of Latin American presidents. And also these leaders usually face fewer judicial constraints on the presidential power. So what we have uh, from these uh, picked uh, evidence uh, from the literature is that there's some personal uh, authoritarian traits to the leader that attempt to do so. Uh, at the same time, they usually face an institutional context that is very favorable to them uh, in order to uh, manage to do to make such reforms, uh, so this is actually uh, 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 this is actually uh, pointing towards a direction that uh, evasion of term limits might be linked to uh, lower and fewer uh, democratic qualities. But specifically, the relationship between evasion of term limits and electoral integrity is yet to be tested by the literature. We could not find any other uh, work or previous work that uh, aimed to shed light to this relationship. And this is, a, this is exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, and even though all this entrepreneur of ours is very exploratory, we do have some hypotheses to test. So for example, our first hypothesis is that to attempt to evade term limits, uh, doesn't matter if it, the leader was successful or not, will be followed by lower levels of electoral integrity. Uh, our second hypothesis is that successful evaders of term limits would damage electoral integrity through electoral institutions and system maneuvers more and in comparison with other forms of electoral rigging. And our third hypothesis is that unsuccessful evaders would damage electoral integrity through voter manipulation and intimidation more in comparison to other forms of electoral manipulation. And why that? Uh, of course, when the leader is successful in evasion of term limits, this might indicate that he already has some institutional support to do so. So when he does that, uh, we expect the electoral integrity to go worse in the future. And this will be due probably to co-optation of the electoral institutions as well. When the leader is not successful in evading term limits, he already finds that he's not very committed to democratic, to democracy in general. So we expect the electoral integrity to be worse, but he would have to count with uh, less complex forms to manipulate elections, and that therefore we are hoping he to uh, 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 do more uh, vote buying or uh, ballot box stuffing, so election day uh, manipulation. Uh, so in, in our entrepreneur to test this hypothesis and to explore this phenomenon, uh, we deploy from previous uh, uh, great efforts uh, mostly Cassani's work on the African executive term limits data set uh, in which he gathered information for African countries and African leaders that uh, uh, manipulated and tried to manipulate term limits uh, in sub-Saharan African after independence. And we put together also uh, to this previous effort, uh, Javier Cojales 2016 paper on Latin American evasion of term limits, also with successful and failed attempts to manipulate term limits. And uh, we add the, to this uh, previous two, the democratic erosion events data set. So we uh, fulfilled the time period until 2020. Uh, Javier Corrales uh, work is for Latin America after redemocratization. So we roughly have here uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America after redemocratization. So roughly 1990 to 2020 is our uh, period of time here. Uh, our data has 421 terms of which uh, 273 are African, 148 are Latin America. Most of these cases are presidents that did not met uh, the presidential term limits. Uh, even the, uh, either the president fell off 
before the term limit would reach it, or he failed to get reelected when it was possible. Uh, in 26% of these cases, the executive term limit was actually respected and the leader stepped off. Uh, in 80 cases, there was no such a thing as executive term limits in those terms. Uh, and of interest here are 32 uh, cases that the leader actually manipulated term limits and 20 cases of failed manipulation. So to first explore this with the data on, uh, on the term level, uh, so we, we, we created this very rough measure of variation of election quality, and we use here, we use here uh, VDEM's Clean Election Index uh, to test that. And so what we did here, we got the electoral quality one year before the leader got to power and, the, and so we tracked it, uh, the electoral quality five years after the leader got to power. Again, this is a very rough measure. We don't know if five years uh, the leader will still be in office or not, but this is just the first thing to try to, to, to explore this relationship. Uh, I must also highlight that positive levels of Delta elect here uh, means that electoral quality got worse. So in this plot, uh, we just created two groups, uh, those mandates, those terms that attempted to evade term limits, uh, doesn't matter if it was successful or not, and those cases that did not challenge term limits. And what we see here is that the group of terms that uh, attempt to evade term limits, they have a consistently uh, uh, worsening levels of electoral quality. And with the TTAS, this difference of means uh, is uh, statistically significant. So this is just a first hint that we our hypothesis might be looking at the right direction. Uh, we also, with the data at the term level, we run some simple OLS regressions with uh, country fixed effects. And we also, again, have a good hint that we might be looking at the right thing here as on the first model that we see in the first column uh, to attempt to evade term limits uh, is actually uh, uh, positively associated with this delta like variable, which means that the electoral quality got worse. Uh, but again, this all this is always very rough, and we did to uh, we had to turn our term level data to a country year level data, uh, so we can explore this better. And with the data on this format, we were uh, we were able to test uh, with different electoral quality related variables as dependent variables. So the first thing we did was to put again, VDEM's collection index as our dependent variable. And we see that in the model without controls, the second model, successful uh, evasion of term limits is uh, significantly uh, and negatively related to levels of electoral quality. But the significance is lost in the models with, uh, with controls. Uh, we also looking at our second hypothesis. And on the presentation right now, I'm just picking some uh, interesting uh, uh, findings or, or, or uh, in the paper you have the whole thing. Uh, so here we try to see if our third hypothesis were true, if failed attempts were linked to uh, worse levels of uh, uh, election days irregularities. But again, this relationship was not significant here. But what we have here is that to attempt to evade term limits is negatively and significantly associated with uh, worse levels of election day irregularities uh, this variable is also taken from VDEM, and this means that there was, uh, we saw more election day irregularities. Uh, and the most interesting finding here is that uh, successful evasion of term limits is linked with worse levels of EMB autonomy, even in the model uh, with controls. Uh, and this is uh, uh, with the uh, comparing to the other effect that we found here, this is actually a, a bigger effect that we have here. Uh, so there might be something uh, going on here that after the leader is successful in evading term limits, the electoral institution uh, present lower levels of autonomy. So just to sum up here, uh, there's still work to be done with this data that we are constructing. For example, Cassani data on the African case has all the different strategies that the leader used to evade term limits. If it were to Supreme Court ruling or legis legislative approval of a constitutional amendment, or if, if it were through a popular referendum. So we might also do that for Latin America to see if a specific maneuver or strategy to, to evade term limits is linked to specific electoral quality related variables. But so far, what we have in this paper, on this version of the paper, is that the incumbent advantage might operate uh, through worse levels and decreases of EMB autonomy. 
uh, and of course, new results in what concerns election day fraud. Uh, this is all for today. Thank you very much for, the, for your time and looking forward to comments and feedback. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, so we'll move on to um, Valerie Rumbazalajeke. My apologies on the pronunciation. Um, she'll be speaking about uh, towards achieving electoral integrity, reforming Zimbabwe's electoral process. Um, so take it away, Valerie. Thank you for the opportunity. So my paper is uh, titled Towards Achieving Electoral Integrity, Reforming Zimbabwe's Electoral Integrity. Sorry, Reforming Zimbabwe's Electoral Process. So the main aim of this paper is mainly to discuss the challenges that are affecting the integrity of Zimbabwe's electoral process. And important to note that is that uh, Zimbabwe has never really had a fully democratic election since uh, we gained independence in 1980. Every single election that we've had since 2000 has been disputed. Uh, and this has resulted in Zimbabwe being the most politically polarized country in Africa. There have been so many irregularities and so many issues that have affected Zimbabwe's political electoral process. And we can say that every form of electoral irregularity can be described to be present in Zimbabwe's election since 2000. And um, also important to note is the fact that we are having elections this coming year in 2023. So there's really need for the electoral process to be reformed for us to have a better uh, chance at having free and fair elections. So some of the objectives that I have for this paper, firstly, it is to preempt the necessary reforms required for a credible election in Zimbabwe come 2023. So there is need for strategies for reform to be put forward, and there is also need to identify the challenges and the gaps that exist in Zimbabwe's electoral process. So this research will therefore be able to address the challenges and gaps that are affecting the credibility of the election. So first, I'm going to just give you a rundown of some of the challenges that we are facing in Zimbabwe um, in our electoral process, and then we'll move on to the reforms. Because for us to understand that why we need reforms, we also need to know what some of the challenges and gaps that exist. But also there is need for a conceptual framework. So for this paper, I used uh, a competitive authoritarian regime conceptual framework and um, it is basically describes that uh, what we call an electoral authoritarian regime whereby we're saying we have a country that holds regular elections where multiple parties compete for positions of power but the thing is most of the things that happen during the elections they violate the basic principles that govern democratic elections and Zimbabwe is deemed to be a semi-authoritarianism uh, we're saying that this is a political system where neither absolute authoritarianism nor full democracy is allowed to flourish for strategic reasons. So competitive authoritarian regimes usually keep up, capture four key areas of democratic consultation. That is the legislature, the electoral space, the media, and the judiciary. If you were to look at these things in Zimbabwe, we see that there is no independence in the legislature. The electoral space itself it is heavily marked with so many violations, so many irregularities. The media has also been captured by the ruling party that is the ZANU-PF, and the judiciary also, it is not independent. So we see that this regime, the ZANU-PF regime, has captured these key institutions. That is why we're saying we have a competitive authoritarian regime. And um, so we move on to some of the challenges that we have that are affecting Zimbabwe's electoral process. The first and the most important when we're talking about uh, electoral challenges in Zimbabwe, it is the institutional design of the electoral management body that we have, what we call ZEC, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Its design itself has caused so many challenges within the electoral process. Why am I saying so? I'm saying so because the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission it is not independent. It is a politicized and militarized institution. Why are we saying it is not independent? One, the president of um, the electoral commission is appointed by the president of the country. So already that person is going to be biased towards what the president wants, wants what the president needs towards the ruling party. So it is partisan and heavily dependent on the ruling party. And um, this has been widely criticized because in most cases we see that the president of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission always acts in a manner that defers to the executive. What the president wants is what the president of the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission does. And also to note is that at least 15% of the commission 
commissioners of the civil charity within the ZIG are serving members or military officials. And just yesterday, we woke up to the news that um, the daughter of a former vice president, who's also the vice chair of the ZANU PF, was appointed as a commission within the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Already, people have no trust within the institution if it is highly partisan. So, how then can this institution work in a way that will further the interests of the citizens? And then, it all, it will work as a way further. Um, the, the, the interests of the president and the executive. And then the second challenge is the role of the security forces. Here we're mainly talking about the interference of the military in the electoral process. We see that the security forces have operated within a system that has allowed elements within their ranks, ranks to arrest, to torture, and to kill perceived opponents with impunity. So the opposition is heavily discouraged and we see that we have the military trying to create an atmosphere of uh, fear intimidation amongst the citizens and that has also affected the voting patterns of the citizens of the country and in 2018 during our last election there was post-election violence as the country witnessed the deaths of innocent civilians who were protesting for the release of election results. And the military shot and killed six civilians who were unarmed. They were just protect, protesting that Zimbabwe Electoral Commission should release results and those civilians were killed. So we also see the main challenge of the military that is interfering in the electoral process. And we also have another challenge of um, the exclusion of voters. So the Electoral Act in Zimbabwe has so many loopholes. For example, it does not allow for Zimbabweans in the diaspora to vote, but it is the right of every citizen of the country to be able to vote. So if you cannot go to a polling station, then you're not allowed to vote. So we have the exclusion of the diaspora and other people, maybe those that are detained in prisons are also not allowed, they cannot vote. So if you cannot walk to a polling station, that means you cannot be able to to vote. Then we also have another challenge of the predisposition to violence, and we can link this to the issue of um, the involvement of the military. So we see that the ruling party has created an atmosphere of fear whereby they use violence to control the behavior of um, the electorate. And we also have another challenge of fraudulent numbers. Voter rigging has been something that has been recurring within um, our elections, 2000, 2002, 2013, 2018. So we have fraudulent numbers that have been made up and this has also affected the credibility or the integrity of the electoral process. And then another challenge is that of the media. And um, the media is expected to be apolitical. However, the media is biased and acts as a propaganda mouthpiece for the ruling party that is an appeal and the other, political parties are not given the same playing field as ZANU-PF is given. And we also have repressive laws such as what we call IPA, that is Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act, which are also still operational within um, the, the, the media space. And this has also caused so many challenges. And um, then we move on to the electoral reforms that are necessary for a credible election. So the first reform that we can talk of is the constitutional reform. And um, this will require two constitutional issues. That is the first one, a change from first past the post to proportional representation. So when talking about first past the post, we're saying that it is a voting method in which citizens of the constituency cast votes for a candidate whom they wish to represent them in parliament. On the other hand, proportional representation is a system in which uh, the people cast their votes directly to a political party. So we're saying there's a need for us to shift from first past the post to proportional representation. Why do we need that? What kind of uh, problems be able to be solved by proportional representation? First, it will allow for the diaspora to vote. Why are we saying so? If a vote is for a party, not for a constituency, then most of the problems in registration and voting disappear. Anybody can vote anyway, even after. So this is uh, critically important for 2023. So the ruling party always makes sure that the diaspora do not vote because if the diaspora votes, that means they will lose um, the seat. Obviously, the, vote, the, the diaspora will vote for the opposition. People want to come back home. They are going outside of the country, maybe to look for greener pastures, but we, these people want to stay at home. They want to be at home. So obviously, they will vote for Zanupia to be out of power. So if we have that reform for moving from 
uh, first past the post proportional representation, it will also solve the issue of um, the diaspora vote, the exclusion of voters and the challenge that I mentioned earlier on. And uh, it will also give effect to uh, section 17 of the Zimbabwean Constitution which requires for a 50-50 representation. So under proportional representation, we see that uh, all parties will have to have equal numbers of women and men as candidates in uh, the electoral process. And this will against um, the candidates who break the hegemon of two parties. And it will allow for a greater range of parties in parliament and also create a greater oversight for parliament. And also it will make sure that there is a case for power in provincial and local government is required by um, section 264 of the constitution, which mainly talks about uh, devolution. Then uh, the second constitutional reform is on the removal of the presidential poll as a separate poll. This uh, reform is quite critical because it will make an election of the president as a party nominee. And this is what happens in South Africa under the ANC. So this means that the party puts forward their candidates for president and vice president. And an elected uh, president remains subject to the party when recalls needed. So that president that has been elected is um, subject to the party. They will always answer to the party. So, um, we're saying that these two changes will certainly problems about registration, also improve um, in matters of inclusion in parliament also, and also allowing for the diaspora to vote. And then um, we move on to the next reform, which is an opening up of uh, the vote for scrutiny. So over the past 30 years, Zimbabwe's voters law has been in shambles and we blame this to Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. And we see that the voters law has not been in place because there are so many large numbers of people who already died who are still part of the voters law. And these are the same people that will be used to rig an election at the end of it all. So in 2013, the voters register was not released in time for inspection and verification. So we're saying that there's need for the release of the voters vote in time so that all political parties, all those that are involved in the electoral process will be able to inspect and verify the uh, voters vote. And this will also deal with uh, several issues that bring forth disputes and challenges within the electoral process itself. So Zimbabwe adopted what we call biometric voter registration for the 2018 election. So we're saying that we need a clean and reliable database which will improve trust and confidence in the system. It is because of this voters vote that people have no trust within the electoral process itself because it is not transparent. It is not open. And transparency relating voters vote itself. And um, this is mainly an issue that we, when we're talking about this, we see we attribute this to the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, which is failing to open up the, um, the voters for, for scrutiny and inspection. So there's also need um, for improvement in voter registration. And, and, and this year, 2022, we've seen a bit of a change in um, voter registration because they've removed some of the stringent uh, rules that they had. And we have what we call a voter registration, this whereby they are going to different um, areas within um, the country, making sure that everyone has the right to vote. Those that do not have the identification are now allowed to get the identification. And if it's a birth certificate, it's in a national ID, you get that, and then you'll be able to register to vote. So we've seen a change um, uh, with, with this uh, voter registration uh, blitz, which has provided for an opportunity to bridge the gap between the commission and the citizens, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission and the citizens. And also another reform is on the analysis of uh, the census. We need to have a census, like we had the census this year. So the numbers from the state census should all should be able to be coherent with the voters vote. So there's also a need for a census to be done carefully and um, be analyzed the likely distribution of voters pay constituencies. So the numbers from the census will be able to guide the delimitation process and allow a challenge with voter registration exceeds the number of uh, probable voters in the constituency. And then- uh, you, have, you have probably about two minutes or so left if you wanted to, thanks.
So another reform that we need to have is on the removal of the secrecy surrounding the ballot papers. There's also a need um, for um, uh, the ballot papers to be able to be scrutinized by different political parties. There's always been some secrecy regarding the, the, the ballot paper. And lastly, we need to have an independent Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Because if the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission is not independent, then that means that the people, the electorate, they have no trust, they have no confidence. So we need the Electoral Commission, this management, electoral management body to be independent for us to have um, um, an election that is credible and uh, we will have electoral integrity. We also need to have um, the removal of um, the electoral forces from interfering in the election and also repealing some uh, repressive laws that exist within um, the country that have also affected the process and also need for a balanced coverage. Um, that is, when talking about the media, we have the media that covers both uh, the ruling party and other parties that are not um, ruling the country, the opposition and so forth. So I think uh, basically that is all that I have for this presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, so we'll move right along to our third presentation. Um, that's Will Sanders from Australian National University. He'll be looking at organizing electoral systems into peer groups and families, avoiding indeterminacy and circularity, staying focused on input rules and mechanics. All right, so um, I see, oh, there he is. Perfect, go for it. Uh, thanks, Holly, and uh, thanks, everyone. This is um, my paper title, and uh, <clears throat> this is me. Uh, uh, this is an overview of the paper. It's in five sections uh, with the headings of the five sections listed at the bottom of this slide. It's um, primarily a conceptual and analytic paper, um, a very general paper, actually. Uh, its uh, normative integrity element comes in the last of the five sections, uh, and it is based on some empirical concerns. Um, but I'm not trying to emphasize those empirical concerns in the written paper, because I really want this to um, be seen as a very general conceptual and analytic paper. But if I gave you the talk that way, uh, you may wonder what the problem is. So in this talk, I am going to give the empirical source and reference for this work up front uh, so that you can understand why I became interested in going back to basics of how we organise electoral systems. So this this, we're, now we're back in 2008. This is the empirical reference that got me going here. I was working in uh, this, this, this part of Australia, the Northern Territory, which is our remote north. Um, there's only of the order, this is a very a sparsely settled area of Australia. There's only of the order of 200,000 people in this jur subnational jurisdiction and a half of them are in the capital city of Darwin in the far north. Um, these are the uh, remote area local governments to the south of Darwin and in, in the rest, uh, and these were newly set up in 2008, and I was observing uh, their first elections, and I was working in this shire here called Central Desert Shire. Um, <clears throat> the particular... Um, uh, the Central Desert Shire, as set up in 2008, had uh, 12 councillors to be elected in four wards uh, in those numbers, two, four, four, and two, in, as we go across. Um, the the, the um, particular ward or district that particularly caught my eye was this ward here, Southern Tanami Ward, which has uh, one big town called Yundamu with about 60% of the population and two little towns, Willara and Nirupi, um, with about 20% of the population each. Um, now, these are, this is remote Australia where there's uh, the uh, uh, indigenous population predominates. Um, uh, so you'll, you may pick up some of the, the, the languages, uh, uh, indigenous language names. 
Um, so what happened in 2008 in this ward was that the big town, Yindamu, um, won all four uh, seats available on this council uh, under a electoral system called multiple majority preferential, although they weren't calling it that at the time, they called it exhaustive preferential, but uh, the, best, uh, the best analytic name for this system is, is multiple majority preferential, uh, which we can come back to. Um, this outcome of the big town winning all four seats was neither anticipated nor desirable. In the reform efforts that had brought this together, uh, I think it was anticipated that the, the seats needed to be shared around between these localities. So these localities are of the order of 200 kilometres apart from each other in, in uh, uh, sparsely settled desert areas. Um, and they didn't get anything like that outcome. Um, and if they'd understood their electoral system, they would have understood that they were likely to get exactly what they got. So I wrote a report um, and uh, a colleague, Ben Riley, I, I wrote a sort of art, my own report, an official report for, for an organisation I was working for at the time called the Desert Knowledge Cooperative Research Centre. Ben Riley wrote a, a report which was commissioned by the Northern Territory Government. Uh, and reform efforts were underway. So, uh, and uh, they looked like they were going to sit on the um, uh, system that they had. And I pushed the minister and uh, various bureaucrats and lobbied. And we did actually get the system changed to a single transferable vote by the time of the 2012 local government elections. And in this instance, the big town won two seats and the other two towns in the Southern Tanami Ward won one each, the two little towns won one each, which was um, more like what was desirable uh, because it gave some sort of locational proportionality uh, to the uh, representation within the local government ward. Uh, and I've just, there's no parties in these um, local governments. This is sort of, uh, so it probably actually emphasises locational issues in, in, in the voting patterns. Um, so my question, what is multiple majority preferential and how does it differ from the single transferable vote? Uh, why, why did I advocate change from one to another and, and what was going, why did they end up with such different outcomes? They're both preferential systems. That means you use uh, numbers to uh, mark your vote. But the difference between them is not in the marking, it's in the counting. What a multiple majority preferential does is repeatedly run an alternative vote count to a majority winning rule uh, with, with just by eliminating uh, candidates and running down to a, a, a two horse race in which one of the candidates has a majority of the votes. Um, this is the, they, they called it exhaustive preferential because they'd, they would repeat this procedure over and over and again. Um, and in each new count, the previous winners would be excluded. And the effect of that was, uh, was effectively to give electors another vote uh, with the same, using the same ballot papers again. So the number of total votes expands beyond the, uh, the number of electors to the number of seats that are being uh, uh, as, uh, uh, determined as well. So votes per elector in the district becomes M um, from this counting procedure, and it comes from the counting procedure, procedure not from the vote marking. So in contrast to a single transferable vote is a different way of counting exactly the same preferential votes. And, um, we, and as its name suggests, only giving each elector in the district one vote. Um, that's what the single transferable vote is. And um, so if there are FC, M seats available in a district, like four in, in the Southern Tanami Ward, the winning number is the droop quota, uh, which is the number of electors or votes uh, divided by uh, M plus one. So in, in this case would be divided by five. So the droop quota uh, in Southern Tanami Ward was around 20%. Um, which is actually what the uh, two single candidates from the two little towns pretty much had uh, on a population basis, because they, they there was just per chance, just one candidate from each of the small towns. So the droop quota for M equals one, of course, is um, actually a majority. Uh, and I think that you can see that uh, the alternative vote and STV are part of the same system. 
My argument back in 2009 was that it was, it was a mistake to use the majority for quote, uh, quota for other than when m equals one, uh, but the multiple majority preferential system does exactly that. Uh, we did win the argument and STV was introduced for the elections in 2012. But what my bigger concern was, so I could have gone home in 2012 and forgotten about it, but my bigger concern was that um, political science didn't actually give me the clear, tool, clear tools to make this argument. Um, I had to sort of rely on contextual argument, but I, I never felt that I had really clear tools and basic concepts and groupings to make this argument. And um, that's where I got to writing this paper. Uh, now, there is a version of this paper that's written or sort of um, uh, published in the Australian Journal of Political Science in um, 2015. This is another attempt to do an even more general thing again. Okay, so this is where we get to the paper and its basic structure. Um, conventional discussions of electoral systems, in, they group them in, often, often run in this order, plurality, simple plurality systems, majority systems, proportional representation systems. Um, after that opening gambit, often there's a shift to majoritarian and proportional representation uh, uh, systems with a, a, a semi-PR system in between. That's seen by many people as a, some sort of innocuous shift, but actually it's a very big shift. Um, plurality and majority are input terms, majoritarian is an output term. So there's a shift here going on from input rules and mechanics to output patterns. And this shift, it seems to me, is um, actually uh, very bad for political science generally, and it creates indeterminacy. For example, where does the single non-transferable vote sit? In the first uh, uh, opening discussion, it's, it's a plurality system. In the second, uh, after the shift, it becomes either semi-PR or uh, PR. Um, it creates, this shift also creates circularity. Electoral systems are actually grouped by their output patterns when they're grouped into majoritarian, semi-PR and PR. And then of course we judge them by their output patterns as well. So my question became, can we avoid indeterminacy and circularity? And can we stay focused on input rules and mechanics in our initial grouping of electoral systems and keep output patterns as dependent variables? And I believe, yes, we can. And there are hints in the political science literature about how we can, um, but this, um, uh, it, it's not, it, it gets, these little hints get, get lost and it just needs a concerted effort to uh, bring us across into an input rule families approach. So the basic way that the, 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 we need to do this is to keep the plurality majority distinction uh, that we often start with and not let it fade away into a majoritarian restriction. So I, we need to keep focused on input rules and not sort of fade across into output patterns. Um, the plurality majority distinction is an unknown known winning number distinction. In a plurality system, you don't know how many votes you need to win. In a majority uh, system, you know how many votes you need to win. In list systems in multi-member districts, and I'm not calling them PR systems, because I don't want to recall anything um, by its output tendency. Um, so in list systems in multi-member districts, this corresponds, this unknown known winning number distinction corresponds to divisor quota differences. Divisor systems in list multi-member systems, uh, systems have simple tally counting and unknown changing numbers that unknown changing winning numbers that come out of the divisor calculations. Quota systems in multi-member districts set and maintain a known winning number for as long as possible. And they try to uh, work towards those known winning number quotas through vote transfers. And then as a last resort, they move to largest remainders when they run out of um, transfer ideas. So two, here's a two table organization of electoral systems, um, which comes at the end of sector in, in, during section three of my paper, where I've sort of set up the uh, basic problem of indeterminacy and circularity. Here is the, uh, the, the first table here is the big common unknown winning 
number family. Um, and the, these two tables, and, the, and then this, the second table is the sort of smaller, far less common known winning number family, uh, which we happen to practice in Australia. Um, so I guess I sort of knew this from the time I was a, a, a primary school boy. Um, but I had to learn about other people's systems, um, and that, that was something that took me quite a long time. So these tables are organised. Uh, in the horizontal dimension, they are, it's the organising uh, differentiator is votes per elector in a district. And most of the systems are in the one vote per elector in the district column, but there are some out, uh, out to the right in the more than one vote elector per district in a column, including the ones that we, um, uh, that were in the, this local government example back in two, 2008 that, that got me in, uh, thinking about about this stuff. So it, um, uh, there's multiple majority preferentials down in the known winning number family over in the M column of votes per elector per district. In the vertical, um, I've differentiated between uh, district magnitude and vote type, whether it's candidate or party list. Uh, so that there's at the moment, there's nine active cells in each of these tables. Looking at these tables, uh, you'll notice that there are no output references in the names. So nothing is called majoritarian or semi-proportional or proportional. Uh, they're trying to label things by their input rules and mechanics. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I have uh, opted for the multiple majority preferential naming. Um, the, the preferential block naming is actually a bit of an output naming um, and the block vote is a, is a bit of an output naming because what, what happens is that you get a hyper-majoritarian block win in these systems. So um, in these tables, there's no indeterminacy. We know exactly or, um, where, where the single uh, transferable vote sits, and we know exactly where the single non-transferable vote sits. It sits in the one vote column um, and with the um, M district magnitude of M voting for candidates. Um, You'll also notice that there's no mixed member systems listed in this table at this point. Uh, well, this, uh, and that's partly because mixed member systems are sort of hybrids. They, and the different, the, the different parts of them, two or sometimes even three different parts of them, may need to be put in different parts of this table. Sorry, so for so, example- um, We're at 15 minutes. So if you're able okay. to wrap up in the next, shortly, that'd be fantastic. Yep. Okay. Uh, this, this, I can actually just finish at this slide, and I'll, but I'll just go a little bit further. So the uh, single member, uh, for, for example, the uh, German or the New Zealand mixed member systems are a combination of single member plurality uh, in the local, in the single member seats, and then list systems, uh, and and there those ones are both in operate in the unknown winning number family. Uh, the Hungarian version uh, uh, of that mixed member systems, as I understand it, operates in the known winning number family. So uh, basically, these tables are the clear tools for argument that are needed um, and to, to, uh, to start debating the, um, um, the, the normative uh, integrity issues around um, uh, the various systems. And basically, the systems that I'm interested in are these uh, systems that are few in number, but that are out to the right in these tables, where there is more than one vote per elector in the district. And my normative stance in the final section of the paper, um, which I will, is basically that these should not be seen as um, as uh, as a representative and dem democratic. They um, Note that this doesn't rule out single member district systems, which proportional representation uh, um, advocates have, have sort of argued against for a long time. But uh, I regard all, all, single, all, all single vote systems as, as having a case for being representative and democratic. But um, I take a normative stance against uh, 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 systems with more than one vote per elector in a district to start an integrity debate. And I think, I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm only starting to start the debate because what I'm trying to do is actually set up clear tools to have the debate. And that's Awesome. Me. Thank you so much, Will. 
Um, all right, so let's move right along to our final presentation of today, Politics of Electoral Reform in Turkey um, by Zeynep Bogar Eger. I'm sorry I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, I should have asked that before we started. Um, but yeah, we can see your screen, no problem. And you can take it away and I'll, I'll let you know when you're at the close to 15 minute mark. But okay. If you're around 12, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my connection is unstable, so I will continue by um, turning off my camera. I'm so sorry for that. So uh, today I will talk about um, just a second. Politics of electoral reform in Turkey, which is which has always been a hot topic in country. And the latest uh, development came just a couple of months ago on March when Turkish parliament passed a new law and lowered the 10% nationwide electoral threshold to 7%. And this measure was first adopted in 1983 by the military as a precaution for fragmentation among parliamentary parties, which led to unstable coalition governments in the previous years. However, the 10% threshold has failed to prevent fragmentation. Rather, it has led to high levels of disproportionality and uh, thus uh, low levels of representation. For example, in 2002 elections, 45% of the votes were not represented in the parliament since these parties failed to pass 10% threshold. And since its adoption, this threshold has been the most controversial electoral system attribute in Turkey. And 41 proposals were made mostly by minor opposition parties to lower or abolish it once and for all. However, these wills were either co-opted by incumbent bills or they were just ignored by the incumbent-led parliament and parliamentary commissions and therefore became null and void. However, this time, this initiative came from the members of the Incomes Alliance, the AKP and MHP in 2022, and took effect very quickly thanks to their control over parliamentary majority. And this change was made a little more than one year before the general elections that is normally scheduled to 2023. So why 7%, not 8, 9, or 5 or 6, but 7? And why now? So I uh, started with this uh, example because it's a great illustration of politics of electoral reform in Turkey. Incumbents forcefully make manipulative changes once they anticipate both laws. Therefore, uh, in this paper, I look at the determinants of electoral reform in Turkey. In other words, the actors involved and their motivations for reform. Also, timing and direction of electoral reforms, and I provide an explanation for this trajectory of electoral reforms in Turkey. In this project, following life part, I define electoral reform as any change that involves electoral formula or any change of at least 20% in district magnitude, legal threshold, or a sample size. Uh, so who are the key actors? Most of the existing studies focus on political parties and politicians. However, in transitional cases, actors other than politicians also emerge as key actors, such as the military, as uh, in two incidences of reform in Turkey. I believe that motivations to change electoral rules are driven by expectations. So how do political actors formulate their expectations? Uh, I also believe that politicians care about designing electoral rules primarily because electoral systems are redistributive institutions. They benefit one actor at the expense of the other. Uh, the seats are distributed to one actor, are compensated by seat losses of another actor. Therefore, an actor should prefer those electoral rules which she believes will bring her the greatest share of seats. But I also think that uncertainty plays a very critical role in here. In established democracies, the effect of electoral rule is known. The changes in voters' preferences are reliably traceable, and party systems are usually stable. 
However, this is not the case in translational contexts like Turkey. Political actors are frequently unable to predict who will compete in the next elections, which parties the voters will support, and what will be the outcome of elections under a new electoral system. Therefore, institutional design is characterized by incomplete information and high degree of uncertainty. And as a result, the strategic behavior of political actors will not necessarily serve their best interests. Institutions may work against interests of their creators. Electoral systems may not deliver the desired outcome. In that case, further uh, rounds of institutional change may be needed, as has been the case with electoral reform in Turkey. So changing electoral rules in Turkey requires the support of parliamentary majority. Therefore, I expect to see that if the incumbents, parties or coalitions have negative or pessimistic electoral expectations, they will make permissive changes that will minimize their electoral losses. And also, if the incumbent uh, parties or coalitions again have positive or optimistic electoral expectations, they will make restrictive changes that will maximize their vote share. And also, when the expectations of the incumbent coalition members diverge, reform is not likely to occur. And to test this, uh, my theoretical argument, I employ a case study approach uh, an assessment of significant electoral reform incidences between 1946 and 2022. And I use a variety of resources such as uh, parliamentary minutes, parliamentary community reports, uh, committee reports, and journalistic accounts. So this uh, table summarizes the electoral system that has been used between uh, 1946 and 2022. Turkish Republic was founded on 1923, uh, and after 27 years of single party rule, the country made its transition to multi party democracy in 1950. This transition uh, was initiated by the adoption of a new electoral law, which maintained uh, the previously adopted majoritarian electoral system while abolishing indirect elections. And democratic politics was interrupted twice by two military interventions in 1960 and 1980. Following the 1960 military coup, a new election was made and a proportional representation adopted. The 1961 law was amended several times until 1980 coup uh, took place. After the coup, another election law was ratified, which retained the PR system but with a 10% nationwide electoral threshold introduced. And since then, several electoral reform incidences took place, which resulted in a decrease in the electoral threshold to 7% in 2022. Uh, this table actually reveals the fact that as a result of the frequent amendments made on four election laws that, uh, that is shown in red, uh, Turkey has experienced seven different electoral systems between 1946 and 2018. And with the lower threshold in 2022, another system would be experienced in the upcoming elections. This table, the second column, shows the proliferation of the number of political parties that were run in elections between 1946 and 2018. And this proliferation However, it does not always reflect a bottom-up demand for a new political movements. Rather, many of these political parties were founded as splinter parties, including, including the very first opposition party in the history of multi-party Turkey, therefore increasing the level of uncertainty within the uh, party system. So, therefore, um, I identify three patterns, uh, three determinants of electoral reform in Turkey. Election laws in the initial uh, design of electoral systems were made under limited electoral competition. And these processes were held by authoritarian leaders. Single party in 1950, the military in 1961 and 1983. And during relatively democratic periods, democratically elected politicians made their efforts to change the rules of the game by amendments. 
So the 1950 electoral reform. Uh, after a failed democratization attempt in 1946, uh, the 1950 reforms took place in an environment where there was limited electoral competition. The Democrat Party was the only party that was confirmed uh, to be established by the 23 years old incumbent CHP. And after a failed attempt, a more democratic election laws was adopted prior to the 1950 elections. The opposition parties supported the adoption of PR, but the incumbent CHP rejected these proposals. As a result, the CHP lost the majority in 1950 elections, and this was a miscalculation uh, that the CHP was actually uh, miscalculated its electoral support. Between 1950 and 1954, the Democrat Party's popularity continued to rise, but after 19, uh, 1954 uh, elections, the Democrat Party took an authoritarian turn due to worsening economic conditions. And the government started to oppress the press and the opposition. And prior to the 1957 elections, the three opposition parties, which were uncomfortable with this uh, authoritarian rule of the uh, government, decided to coordinate their electoral strategies. They agreed on that each party ran for the constituency where they are the most powerful and others would support that party in that constituency. And if the first option would not be available, they decide to merge under the name of the one of the opposition parties. However, the Democrat Party government amended the election law by making restrictive changes in terms of candidacy and uh, party access to the elections. Thus, the attempts of the opposition to coordinate in the 1957 elections failed. In the elections, the Democrat Party's votes decreased, but due to the majoritarian electoral system, it got enough vote to hold parliamentary majority. But following elections, the economic conditions and rising political tensions increased to a significant extent that a military coup overthrew the Democrat Party government in 1960. And after the coup, uh, the military established a constitutive assembly and electoral commission to draft a new law. With an objective of achieving proportionality and fairness, the commission designed an electoral system based on proportional representation with the Hunt formula, along with the district threshold in 1961. The first elections were held in the same year, and none of the uh, four parties competing in the elections won a parliamentary majority. And until 1965, short-lived coalitions dominated the electoral scene. And prior to the 1965 elections, an amendment made to the election law that changes the electoral formula. The amendment adopted national remainder system, which was extremely proportional representation system that was famous minor parties, unlike uh, the Hot. So the initiative came from the CHP and supported by the all minor parties. The Justice Party, on the other hand, was critical because they argued that it was CHP's move to prevent them to control parliamentary majority, whose support was uh, increasing within that period. And in 1969 elections, the Justice Party achieved to control the parliamentary majority and abolished nation remainder system with the support of its parliamentary majority. And due to proliferation of political parties, none of the political parties achieved to win a parliamentary majority in the next uh, 1973 and 1977 elections. And another period of unstable coalition uh, governments just opened up. And the end of 1970s were marked by political instability, political violence, approaching to the limits of civil war and severe economic problems. And as a result, the military once again overthrew the democratically elected government in 1980. So after the 1980 coup, the military authorized another commission to draft a new law. However, unlike the military government in 1980 coup, the non-civilian chamber National Security Council had the real authority to revise and approve the drafts. The 
the new electoral system that they designed retained the PR system based on the HOND, but with 10% nationwide threshold, along with the district threshold. The objective was this time um, achieving parliamentary stability. The Commission's report defines the adoption of this 10% threshold on the grounds that it prevents representation of small parties. And the new system will be applied in the uh, 1983 elections, which were uh, neither fair nor free because only three parties were allowed uh, to compete in the Very elections. Zainab, you're at 15 minutes. If you could start wrapping up, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, in the upcoming years, parties made uh, three different changes in order to restrict the newcomers' entrance into uh, the electoral competition. So uh, in 2002, early general elections were a turning point in terms of party system and electoral dynamics in Turkish politics. The AKP won a clear majority and formed a single party government for the first time since uh, 1987. And as such, the AKP controlled nearly two uh, thirds of the seats with about one third of the votes. And in a sense, the previous failure uh, to decrease the 10% threshold has led to the electoral victory of the AKP, which will dominate the electoral scene in the following uh, 20 years. Between 2002 and 2011, AKP increased its vote share in a row and established its predominance in the party system. And in 2015 June elections, the party lost its parliamentary majority. And in 2017, uh, Turkish voters ratified several constitutional amendments that replaced existing parliamentary regime with presidential system with very limited checks and balances. And this major political regime check instilled a partisan president who functions as the leader of a political party, chief executive, head of state, and elected on a political party ticket. And prior to the 2018 SNAP elections, uh, the AKP and MHP jointly in introduced a new law that made uh, significant changes on the electoral laws. For instance, since the 1950 electoral reform, electoral administration has been supervised by the judiciary. Yeah, I'm going to have to. This is um, just uh, so last sentence. Okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, since the 1950 electoral reform, electoral administration has been supervised by the judiciary as an impartial observer. However, this latest uh, amendments has changed this practice by allowing governors who are appointed public authorities to appoint public officials as election council members in each constituency. And these amendments, the latest amendments can, came in 2023 when the uh, incumbent coalition jointly uh, passed a new law to lower the electoral threshold from 10 to 7%. Uh, so maybe I can conclude uh, during Q&A. Sorry for running out of my time. I'm just stuck.